Hello there, and welcome to uh, lesson 5.5 of the video lessons. Um, well, it's probably coming out in lesson 6, but um, we are looking at the LibLab Pact today, which is in reality most likely to be only a part of a 1906 question. There is a small chance that the exam board might choose to make an entire essay question about it, however, hence the reason we're having a bespoke video about it. Um, the usual warning applies in terms of the um, lack of specific evidence here. We do not care about specific examples, or else we'll get bogged down and be just listing of facts. Use the K Drive um, LST lower six history um, reading or your textbooks to get those things. You must have them. The point of these videos are the analysis, which might not come up in the reading. So, the LibLab Pact. Essentially, this is not a formal or public agreement. Liberals and Labour are naturally for the progressive parties, i.e. more left-wing parties. Up until 1900, there was, if you were a progressive, you voted for the Liberals, apart from a couple of elections here or there. As time goes on, and by 1903, it is clear that the LRC, not the Labour Party at this point, it's not the Labour Party yet, um, are increasing their power and they will contest more elections. Now we mentioned splitting the vote um, last lesson, but we're going to go over that very quickly again if you're not sure. But essentially there is a fear that the people who always voted in certain constituencies for Liberals may now be tempted to vote for Labour. So say you had a constituency in, I don't know, let's say... Manchester, actually Manchester is quite Tory at this point. Um, so you have one in um, Cornwall, okay? St Ives. And the um, St Ives, they all vote Liberal, okay? 50% Liberal, 35% uh, Tory, and then just ran them up for people for the rest. Okay, there's a lot more independent parties at this point in politics. Now, if the Labour Party come along, no, very few of the Conservatives will go, oh yeah, Labour, that sounds like good, they sound like my idea, and then they'll vote for it. A couple might, and working class Tories might, but in reality it's very unlikely. What might happen, though, is that 20% of, of those Liberals, okay, or 20% you know, of those Liberals, who, of those 50% Liberals who voted um, for Liberals, might be convinced to go and vote for the Labour Party. So in the 1906 election, what might happen is, the same 35% of people vote for the Tories. However, the Liberal vote is split, whereas before 50% voted, and therefore Liberals would have won comfortably. We now have 20% voting for the Tories, for the um, Labour Party, and therefore the remaining 30% voting for the Liberals. Therefore, if you look at the breakdown of results, you've got 15% to independent parties, 30% to Liberals, 20% to Labour, and 35% to the Tories. So the Tories win that seat. This is a first past the post system. So therefore, there is a huge fear that naturally, with the rise of Labour, there might be a splitting of the vote, that's what we call it, okay, and therefore the Tories will win, and many constituencies, even if they don't have a majority. So therefore, what the secret pact of 1903 is, is in theory, at least on the surface, actually it's much deeper than this, as we shall see, a agreement to avoid splitting the vote. OK, I we will run somewhere here. You will run someone there. We will not contest each other and encourage all the liberal voters to vote for Labour voter in one constituency and all the Lib Labour supporters to vote for liberals in the other constituency. OK, um, if in, the electoral district in this um, laws in this point are much more complex and there are such things as double candidate boroughs, boroughs where you vote for um, two people. One, you might say one of those people is a liberal, one of those people is a um, Labour Party member, for example. Um, and there was also a vague agreement to work together in Parliament, but not as a coalition. OK, so this was the pact, essentially. It was in 1903. Um, uh, fear, fearing that the election coming up in 1907, because I don't know it's coming up in 1906, remember, because it's every seven years, there will be split votes and that will cause problems. Okay? This is not a public um, agreement. The Liberals don't want to be tainted with the image that they are compromising with socialists, because that will alienate their right wing. The Labour Party doesn't want to be tainted its image that it is basically a Liberal Party pressure group, and therefore that would discourage people from even bothering to vote for the Labour Party. 
Okay. So what ends up happening is it's unofficial policy, but in reality, behind the scenes, particularly McDonald, go, works very, very hard to ensure that people who are running in as Labour Party members in constituencies where Labour, the Labour Party had agreed with the Liberals that they wouldn't run anyone, i.e. so Liberals, Liberals have said, I let you run in West Ham and you don't run in Bromley. Okay, so Labour Party says, all right, we're not going to run in Bromley. But then someone turns up and says, I'm running as a working class candidate, I want to run for the LRC in Bromley. McDonald ensures that most of these candidates do not get the LRC ticket. What that means is they can say they're part of the LRC. Even if they are members of the LRC, they, uh, McDonald makes sure they don't get the branding, the recognition. And that does hurt their voting chances. And therefore that helps avoid them winning and therefore helps the Liberals win in that constituency. It is not perfect. Those that working class candidate in Bromley will still get some votes, but they will just get fewer votes and no money from the Liberal, Labour Party in order to win that election. Therefore, they're far, likely, far more likely to lose. As a result of the 1906 election and the Lib Lab Pact, of the 50 LRC candidates, 31 were unopposed okay, by the Liberals. Okay? Um, sorry, 31 um, oh yeah, were unopposed, and of those 31, 24 were elected. Okay, so what that means is they went on a post full stop. These 31 were against Tories, but the majority of them, once here in one of these constituencies, won. Okay, Similar, similarly, the Liberals also benefit. There are certain areas which have been traditionally um, Tory working class areas. Manchester East, we mentioned last time, um, but also places like Liverpool and places in Lancashire. The Liberals won those seats. Because the Labour Party, which has far more sway over the unions, far more sway over the um, workers, endorse the Liberals. I.e. the Liberals come up and no one ever votes for them because they're the party of the rich middle class. But then the work, then Labour Party comes up and all the LRC comes up and says, no, no, vote for Liberals, they have our support. That is quite useful to get people to vote for the Liberals in those areas and therefore they win them. Okay, So you can say that the Labour Party does well because they get a number of seats. But previous to this, they had one or two which they frequently lost in by-elections. So they, they had no parliamentary party. And now, as a result of this pact, they were unopposed in lots and lots of elections, and therefore they now have a core group in Parliament. As we shall see, this is one of their key objectives. The Liberals have won <coughs> seats which they might not have won without the working class support, and certainly wouldn't have won if had the vote been split further. Okay? The Labour Party... A, not taking votes away from the Liberals in the um, uh, Manchester East, but at the same time pointing at the Liberals and saying, vote for them, working class people in your cloth gaps, and therefore helping to get the vote is very helpful. The Liberals also, um, because they did not have to fight every seat, therefore they could maximise their resources. The Labour Party fought some seats, the Liberals fought other seats. By fighting lots of seats, you A, increase your chance of winning the seat, and therefore winning more um, seats in Parliament. But also, the Conservatives, if you remember from last lesson, had in 1900 had very few contest, no, had a number of seats which were not contested, which means they could concentrate their resources in, in certain seats which were contested, and therefore more likely to win. Now that the Labour Party and Liberals are fielding hundreds of candidates in pretty much all constituencies, most constituencies, not all, um, the Conservatives have to divide up their resources, their money for fighting the election and their time amongst many, many more constituencies. And you can argue that the Liberals, because they don't have to worry about certain constituencies, are able to do that better. They don't have to worry for about 50 other constituencies, so therefore they can spend that money elsewhere. This in turn means the Conservatives have, to, um, have less money per seat to spend and therefore arguably are hurt nationally as a result. So the Live Lab Pact, in theory, helps both sides. However, there is, and what the most questions on this, if it comes up, will be on, is this idea of, in reality, did it actually help? Or did it actually, was it actually a poor deal for the Liberal Party or the Labour Party? Most questions will say it's a poor deal for the Liberal Party. So what we're going to do is look at the arguments for and against whether or not this was a good deal or not. So to begin, we're going to look at um, the Labour Party and what their objectives were. 
we will only work out if this is a good idea, deal is we see, okay, what do they want coming out of this deal? Did they get it? If they did, it was a good deal. If they did not, it was a bad deal. Okay, so um, first things first, Ramsey McDonald, he's the leader of the Labour Party of the LRC at this point, okay, who is a, a you know, who by 1931, as for, if, I don't, if you've not been taught this yet, we can't say in a second, um, is a very, very controversial figure, a very bad man, everyone hates him. He is classic socialist backstory, self-taught um, rural child, worked his way up through competence and hard work, all the way to running the Labour Representation Committee. He was the moderate wing of the party. He is a deeply strategic, long-term vision sort of man. And essentially, he is a driving force behind the Lib Lab Pact, although he denies it later because it hurts him politically, because it makes him look like, more like a moderate. He looks at the Lib Lab Pact not as, oh, I care about 1906 or 1907. Okay, I don't care about elections, really. He sees it as a helpful thing for the 1920-1930 elections. His calculation is, in reality, the idea that people will not vote for the Labour Party. The Labour Party is tainted with the image of socialism. In the country, uh, other countries, socialists are bombing stuff, they are revolution stuff, and they're saying lots of crazy stuff. There are some people in the Socialist Party, I mean, the, in the LRC or various different Socialist Parties in Labour, um, like the uh, Social Democratic Fe um, Federation, who are talking about revolution. This terrifies the average middle class opinion. This terrifies, arguably, the average working, upper working class opinion. It's seen as radical. It's seen as crazy. It's seen as pie-in-the-sky idealistic. So therefore, people won't vote for it. And for as long as the Labour Party are seen as a weird ideological group, they will not win an election. However, the only way, therefore, this can be reversed is by giving an image that actually... It's a proper political party with proper MPs who do proper things, not socialist things, who are showing themselves that they are sensible, mature members of government who can help. Therefore, he's not looking to win in 1906. He knows he's not going to win. But his objective is actually to make sure that there is a, um, a core nucleus of MPs in the Labour Party, that you can say there is a parliamentary Labour Party, because yes, they, you had one or two guys in Parliament, but they're just weirdo sort of pressure individuals. You want a nice core of reliable, moderate men, not Keir Hardy, in Parliament. You want them all working together, and you want them dressed up in suits. You want them helping with government. You want them pushing a socialist line, but in a very moderate way. And you want to get people used to the idea that the Labour Party is, yes, they are technically socialist, but they're moderate and they are governmental because people will not vote for you in any numbers to win an election until you've done this. So for him, this pact is a good way of guaranteeing that small nucleus of support. Okay, he will get, he knows as well the pact, he will get that small group of MPs from which he can build the legitimacy of the party. So, as we shall see, arguably, McDonald is very successful with a Lib Lab pact. You can say it's a failure because not many Labour MPs got elected, but that's really stupid because he didn't want or aim for most hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Labour MPs to get elected. Otherwise, he would have run more than 50. Instead, as a long-term strategic argument, as long-term, like, um, we will prove ourselves, it is a very, very successful thing. So arguably, therefore, as we shall see, MacDonald does very well out of this and he achieves his aim. So it's a success for Labour. Um, in terms of the Liberals, they had a bit more, they were, had a trickier situation. They saw that the Labour movement, the LRC, was growing. And they saw that ultimately there's only so much new liberalism can do. Okay. And at this point, the Labour Party is small. It doesn't have a sense of direction. It doesn't have a huge base of support. It doesn't have much money. So it is weak. But if it is just left on its own, it will grow. Working class support is getting greater. It is the power which is rising. So therefore, you cannot just leave them. Now, they had temporarily dealt with it with new liberalism. They say, oh, look at our left-wingness. Flag, flag, flag. Look at this. Okay, brilliant. But the problem is, 
this bec will become a race to the bottom because the Labour Party, when it gets more organised, will just simply promise more left-wing stuff. And the Liberals will then either have to go even more left-wing, but then probably lose its right-wing to the Conservatives, or it would have to say, no, we're not going that far, and in which case it will very quickly become a two-horse race where Liberals are pointless. Okay? So, they need to get rid of the threat of Labour. What they want in their ideal world is the Labour Party to join and combine the Liberal Party and become a pressure group, almost. A group within um, the Liberal Party, which in reality will never forget its heritage, never see itself as separate or different, but as a member of the Liberal Party, does not compete for votes. Okay? <clears throat> So what they want, essentially, is the parties to merge. If the parties merge, there's not as a threat on the left flank. You cannot just turn up on one day and say, will you join us? And they say yes. You need to show cooperation. You need to work together. You need to show that you um, can trust each other. And then slowly you'll increasingly merge. Arguably, the big, one of the big things behind a bit of Lib Lab Pact, apart from wanting to avoid splitting the votes so that they will win in 1906 um, or 1907 um, is to help make a step towards a merger. Now, this is a diagram of, of in each election, who voted for whom in every election. And the, as you can see, the 1906 election is arguably the beginning of the end of liberalism. Okay, if you see that the first line, which is the the solid lines going from top to bottom of the elections, um, the 1906 election, um, and so then the 1902 calculations, the 1906 election um, is a real f first jump, and then we have after World War um, Two, sorry, World War One, the massive jump in 1918. Are many people argue, must admit, some historians argue that by allowing the Liberal Party, the Labour Party a nucleus of MPs, by allowing them to get that first step in Parliament, the Labour Party only grow and grow and grow and crush and at the expense of the Liberals. Had the Liberals not given the Labour Party that support, they would have still won 1906 and the Labour Party would have been weaker. So this is the argument against the Lib Lab Pact, essentially, that it was great for Labour, but for the Liberal Party, if their two objectives was to get more votes so that they win 1906, that, the argument against that is, well, they, got, they had a landslide. They didn't need those 30 or 36 seats that um, the, Liberal, the Labour Party bring them. Yeah? So they won a landslide, yeah, so that, that was pointless. Um, and also, if it was about joining and merging with the Labour Party long term, that clearly doesn't happen. So that fails. So the Liberal Pact, all it does is it strengthens the Labour Party at the expense of Liberals, and doesn't do anything for liberals. So it's seen as a mistake. Okay? So, the argument, as mentioned, for the pact being a mistake for liberals, the Liberal Party did not need to worry about splitting the vote. It did not need to um, uh, worry about um, making sure it wins certain constituencies. Because they won a huge landslide, they did not really have to worry about it. The counter-argument to this is, well, several things. Number one, you don't know the effects. You can't measure the effects of avoiding splitting the vote just because they, how many of those seats which they won in the landslide were won because the Labour Party did not run against them. The Labour Party might not have won the seat, but they would have at least um, uh, drained support to give, to give support to the Conservatives. But more than this, this agreement, and you must always keep this in your mind, this agreement is in 1903. The Balfour government has just started. They haven't done most of their disastrous things, and the tariff argument hasn't really started yet either. It is not obvious that there's going to be a landslide at all. The Liberals have lost 20-odd, 20, 20 years of elections prior to this. There is no evidence at all that's going to change. So, yes, you can see with the benefit of hindsight, well, obviously, look at, look at the um, landslide. Of course they're going to win. But this agreement is not made with that hindsight in mind. Now, this agreement is made when people who have lost every election for the last 20 years, they are seemingly got have a, with a government who it, the Boer War is still going well and they are still well organised um, and they're still unified, that they're going to lose against. So you should try everything possible. Okay. Um, one of the um, set other arguments against the um, uh, PAC being a mistake is that by allowing a small nucleus of Labour Party members in 
Parliament, the Labour Party becomes a more legitimate, more has the image of a being a sensible party of government, which in turn means that with that position they will then grow and grow and grow and grow and destroy the Liberals. They, they will take the Liberal vote. Now the arguments against this are, well, number one, that was not inevitable. Okay. Number two, there's no reason why even after this you couldn't join them. Okay. Um, and also, the Labour Party probably would have done this anyway. You can argue the pack speeds up. They, this happened in 1906 rather than 1910 or 1914. But in reality, there's no sign that the Labour Party wouldn't rise at some point. The Labour Lab Pact, all it does is perhaps accelerate it. But you can say that was a worth, that was a you know worthwhile gamble if it had paid off, if it had led to the Liberals and Labour Party joining up, and therefore led to um, the Liberal Party being saved. And you could argue, as well as this, the Lib Lab Pact um, gives the Labour Party representation in Parliament, okay, where it then will use that position to only get more votes. Okay, what the Labour Party does in government, essentially, and we'll do this as part of the What Does the Labour Party Do in Government <coughs> lesson series, um, is they are not officially part of the Liberal government. Popular laws, they will vote for. And so they say, look, we are good, look, we vote for popular laws. They will then criticise everything the Liberals do, saying it's not far enough. So they are almost like a very critical little brother. They are they have no other responsibility. They have no like need to worry about actually getting laws passed because they know the liberals will do it. So they can brand themselves as look, we're like the liberals, but we demand even more for the working class votes. So for example, in pensions, they're like pensions very good, vote for pensions, but we would have given you more. And then the working class people go, Oh yeah, like actually the liberals are labor are like nicer liberals. Or unemployment insurance, yes, or minimum wage. You know, we, oh yes, winning wage is very good, but we would have given you more. And there's nothing you can really do against that because they're voting for the law. Okay, you can't say, well, they're, they're betraying you, but they're ignoring you because they are voting for it. They're just also saying, yeah, we'll vote for it, but we'll do better. And in reality, that means that throughout the government, the Labour Party is constantly just chipping away at the Liberals and attacking the Liberals and getting working class support from the Liberals because they're in Parliament able to sort of make this impression. Arguably though, against this, is the, what stops them doing that outside of Parliament? Had they not won many MPs, they could still do that. They could just do it in the press, not, not in Parliament. Arguments against this being a mistake, therefore. Okay. Arguably, as mentioned, how were they to predict there was going to be a landslide in 1903? How can we therefore blame them about wanting to um, um, to get enough seats. Arguably as well, one of the big contributing factors towards the um, uh, election victory was the fact that the Tories had to fight pretty much every seat, which meant they had to divide up their resources. By having the Lib Lab Pact, you made the, fight, the Tories have to fight more seats, and therefore they had to um, spread their resources much thinner, which means they were actually less effective per resource. As well, arguably, you can say as well, this could, ha the, if a liberal plan was to use this as a stepping stone to unite the Labour Party, this could have worked. But the Liberal Party themselves and the war World War One are the real things which then drive the Labour Party away. So it's not the pact which leads to it being a failure. It's the plan is to use the pact in order to get the Lib Labour Party to join them. It wasn't the pact. It was what happened after the pact, which meant the Labour Party was increasingly annoyed by the Liberals and therefore refused to join them. And arguably, um, the things which helped the Labour Party rise, including Liberal failures, are more than Lib Lab Pact. It's not as if the Liberal Labour Party wasn't a p potential force, and then suddenly, because they've got 20 odd, well, 30 odd um, M M MPs in Parliament, they now matter. They were always a force. The social economic changes are naturally benefiting them. They were going to rise, arguably less quickly, but they were still going to rise. So you can't simply say, well, it's the fault of the Liberal Pact that the Liberals were crushed, because arguably the things which make Labour rise are more complex than the Liberal Pact. It's the fact that the Liberals aren't very good at keeping working class voters support um, um, happy. It's the fact that the um, Labour Party has some very good leaders. It's the fact that long term social economic change means that the working classes will have more political say, which benefits Labour. That stuff leads to the rise of Labour and the crushing of Liberals, not the Liberal Pact. 
All that does is it makes it slightly easier to get some MPs in Parliament and look respectable. But you know, we always point out, well, if that's true, if just simply having MPs in Parliament it makes you look respectable, how comes by 1914 um, the Labour Party had actually lost seats in by-elections and actually had fewer seats in 1914 than it did in 1906? If it was proving itself so effectively as a result of the um, uh, the Lib Lab Pact, how comes people weren't voting for them? So, the overall question, therefore, how far was it a mistake? In reality, it's very hard to attack this as a Labour Party mistake. Labour Party do very well out of this. They do get that legitimacy, etc., etc., etc. The Liberal Party is a bit more complicated. You can say it does help catalyse and help the Labour Party, anything that helps the Labour Party, with the benefit of hindsight, where we know the Labour Party then destroys the Liberal Party, is bad. But you must always consider what's going on at the time. It is not obvious that they are going to win 1906. It is not obvious the Labour Party will not join the Liberal Party. Okay? It is not obvious that the um, Labour Party will ignore pretty much all of the um, overtures to try and join them. It is not obvious that the mining unions and all the working classes will so quickly join the Labour Party. So therefore, you can, although it perhaps doesn't help the Liberal cause, the forces which arguably destroy the Liberals are much greater than simply the Lib Lab Pact. And I would say, therefore, the best characterization of the Lib Lab Pact is it certainly doesn't help. And it arguably catalyzes the rise of Labour, ergo the fall of the of Liberal Party. But actually, the forces which really cause that dynamic are broader than the Lib Lab Pact. It's the fact there's more working class people. It's the fact that there's, there's World War I. It's the fact unions are stronger. It's the fact that the Liberals are not actually great at keeping people happy. Okay, and it's the fact the Labour Party is really well led. Okay, that's the Lib Lab Pact, a curiously quick one. Um, next session, we are going to do an absolute mammoth, I might wait until lunch to that, absolute mammoth session on the liberal reforms, which is four potential essay questions in one whole lesson. So until then, I will see you um, later.